studio. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. It's great to get a chance to come out here and talk with you and get a chance to share some ideas and make you think a little bit about some things as well. Uh, just a little bit about ourself. Uh, in Moment, uh, we, we've been around to, uh, now uh, for 15 plus years. Uh, we currently have uh, over 450 clients, over 500 national brands and international brands. We have about 350 employees now with offices in the US, Canada, Europe, and we just added an office down in Melbourne. Uh, and so we've had a lot of chance to kind of go through and grow over the last number of years. We work in a lot of languages, my goodness. Uh, we collect data in 95 plus countries now and over 90 languages to kind of map that. Uh, we listen in a lot of places. Uh, last year, we collected about 150 million customer reviews. So everybody knows Yelp, right? Anybody know how many reviews Yelp has collected in their 17 years? 120 million. So last year, we collected more reviews than Yelp has in their 17 years. So we're behind a lot of brands. Uh, we collect a lot of information for these, and we use that information to help these brands understand the customer. If you could read 10,000 comments from your customers every month, you'd know exactly what your customers' expectations are, you'd know how you're performing, and you'd always make the right informed business decisions. That's why we use things like text analytics, video analytics, speech, and other types of things to go through and extract these stories and help these brands make the right decisions and to be able to stay on top of their game. Um, after the breakout, I'll spend a little more time, if those want to come up in the Q&A, talk a little bit more about our company. Uh, but just a pitch, we're always looking for people to come up for interns. I think we had about 20 people for interns this last summer and love to have more. So uh, I think we'll be on, there's a list or somewhere that we need to get signed up on. So a few things about my experience. Um, I uh, started right out of school at a company called Sterling Wentworth. Uh, this was a bootstrap company, uh, meaning they didn't take any formal VC funding. When I joined, I think I was employee number 15 right out of school. And I was like all eager and excited and they had like $2 million in revenue and they told me, if you can't go get this deal, you don't have a job. So I've been, I was hired on, I became a salesperson and I was in charge of designing the software all at the same time. Uh, over the next seven years, we, we grew that company to around 20 some odd million in revenue and ended up selling it for 66 million. It was a great success story. At the end of that, about 85% of the company's revenue came from products I designed and developed. It was a wonderful experience for someone right out of school. The next company I went to was right in the middle of the dot-com era. My goodness. <laughs> I, I, uh, I got caught up in the hype and got all excited, and, and you guys are probably too young to know how terrible that was, but uh, there were a lot of companies that took in a lot of money and ultimately ended up dying. Uh, I was involved with an online collaboration company, Blue Step, and um, we took in $20 million, went through a horrific two and a half years of crazy work, and at the end of it, we ended up crashing the ground like everybody else. Uh, at the end of that cycle, I remember it was April 15th on tax day, and I was sitting there, we were trying to help our employees find jobs. I was the chief technology officer of Blue Step, and I was sitting there going, man, this is just brutal, what are we gonna do? And helping other people go through and find other opportunities. And then I read an article in Inc. Magazine that said 500 other companies, tech companies, dot coms, had died in that quarter. And I thought, wow, there's 500 people with my title looking for a job. <laughs> kind of a rough day. Uh, okay. He used to say, I went out and decided to start a company. It was easier to start a company than it was to go through and find a job. And it was something I'd always wanted to do. And it, it, this is for your own thing. When the economy is actually in a downturn, it's great to be able to find people that are willing to work for a lot less money. In this case, I had access to a lot of people that currently didn't have a job. And there were about 10 of us that started working with no pay. And decided to start a business up and see what we could do. <clears throat> Pardon me. Let me take a drink. So what I'd like to talk about is a little bit of difference between um, a bootstrap company and a VC company. And the reality is uh, these companies, the, depending upon how you're started, will have different kinds of pressures, uh, different kinds of cultures. I think this is an important thing if you talk about the importance of balance of family life and religion and everything else in your life. It's important to understand these things. Different kinds of ownership, <clears throat> different kinds of control, and the reality is some companies can only be started in one way or another. 
Uh, think of a pharmaceutical company. How long does it take to get a drug to market? Anybody know? It's like a decade plus. A decade's a good one, right? So it's brutal. So yeah, unless you want to go without pay for 10 years, you might want to consider getting some outside funding. Yeah. Oh, good point. So VC, venture capitalist, right? So if you go out and raise money, you present your ideas in a business plan, in a form one. Venture capitalists are the ones that usually fund you know, early startup companies. And they'll usually want something in return for that. So if you're going out and raising $5 million for a company that has no revenue, well, there's going to be a cost. And they're going to take it. I usually like to think of them as coming along and, you know, like Rumpelstiltskin, possibly claiming your firstborn. Because they can take a lot. <laughs> so you've got to be careful. Obviously, I'm, I'm really biased towards bootstrap. Prove your idea out. Start it in your, in your basement. Start it in your parents' garage. Get it proved out before. <coughs> Pardon me. The VC company, um, I'd like to maybe tell a, a parable. Does there someone like to come up and volunteer and come up here and help me? Come on up. Come on up. So this is just a parable I like to tell. And I'll give you a shirt. How's that sound? You can choose a Darth Vader or a, some other shirt. I've got a couple shirts here. Okay. What's your name? Scott. 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 Okay. You got a good imagination? Yeah. All right. So we're up in the mountains. Okay. Behind us is this beautiful lodge. Okay. Okay. Six estate, six giant suites inside. It's a beautiful place. Looks out over the valley. There's an attached big toy barn. Every single kind of toy in the world you can imagine. Stables over to the side. It's awesome. Here's what I need you to do. I need you to give 110%. I need you to sacrifice the next five to seven years and really put your time and energy and put the company first. And if you do all of that, someday all of that will be mine. All right, go ahead and sit down. <laughs> no, come here, let me get you a shirt. <laughs> what do you want, Tara? Darth Vader or Spider-Man? Um, oh hard pick, not pick the, the, right. the BYU, you know? There you go, there you go. So, <laughs> does it happen? Yeah, uh, sadly I've seen this happen quite a few times with friends. I'll tell you a story of a company we purchased. About three years ago we purchased a company that, uh, <coughs> pardon me, was in our same space. Similar size, similar revenue, but we were growing and they weren't. So we were worth about three times what they were. We bought them up and they'd raise money three times, which is uh, typical. So they'd raise money three different times, but by the time we purchased them, because of the preferences on the money, their founder, now, by the way, we, we, we spent quite a bit. It was tens of millions of dollars we paid for this company. <clears throat> you'd think it'd be something good for the founder, right? If you buy a company for $40 million, you'd expect to make something for it, right? <sighs> yeah, that's the sad part. How much money do you think the founder made? No. What would you expect? If a company sold for $40 million, you founded it, how much do you think you should make? Majority? Okay. What? So more than 20 million. Any odds? What else? Actually, he got around $250,000. That was all gone. It was all taken up. It was owned by somebody else. Kind of sad. Now, that wasn't my problem. I, I, I wasn't aware of any of this. I was just making a bid on buying a business. But that's what can happen. And you can go through and you end up taking too much money in. And before you know it, you're working for someone else and they own your business. You're having to do all the work, all the sacrifice. Someone else makes the money. It's a sad story. Okay, so the bootstrap company, not as glamorous. <laughs> in our case, we had my mother-in-law's kitchen table as our conference room table. <laughs> we, our chairs in our conference room didn't match because we just took whatever was left over. Literally, it was in the dot-com age. We just would steal whatever was left over. Steal is not the right word. It's a terrible word to use. There was what was left over in the, our particular building. B businesses were shutting down left and right, and we, they would say, hey, you can go take the furniture from this place. So we'd go up and take it. It was great, free furniture. And so we'd go through and collect furniture, and it was like, yeah, we had a lot of different chairs, but it <laughs> didn't matter to me. They were free. The desk didn't match. I mean, you just did what you had to, right? And running out of money was just kind of a matter of business. And I think that's the important part here as you think about this, is if, if you're cautious at the beginning and not raising your salaries, not going through and raising expectations, the problem is if your burn rate, what it takes to run your business, kind of your, basically think of it as what you're paying for salary, your payroll check. If you've raised it up this high, but you only have this much money, guess what? No payroll. And suddenly, what do you do with your employees? And that's the reality. There's a lot of businesses right now in Utah, big popular ones that you guys, if I threw, shoot through the names out there, you'd go, oh yeah, that don't make money. They're spending someone else's money today in the hopes that they'll be able to be successful tomorrow 
kind of a scary situation when you get in there. And you know, we always think, oh, they, they must be doing so well, and it doesn't always work out that way. So running a business, being careful. We went through and, and we were all making, everybody was taking just a teeny little sliver of a salary. And we'd, we'd raised a little bit of money from a few angel investors. We were targeting $480,000 for about 15% of our company. And we were trying to be real careful, and that was about, we thought, hey, we could actually get the company off the ground. We've been working for like 12 months. <laughs> we were like, we're gonna make this. They gave us a first allotment of money, $240,000, and uh, we were getting real close. We got it a, a, from Great Clips. They gave us a verbal, a million dollar contract. We're like, we're gonna make this. But we thought, okay, it's gotta be a few more months before we get a sign and get money flowing. And then our investors, who were supposed to send us the next tranche of money, said, well, you guys didn't hit the targets, so we're not gonna send you the money. And we're gonna go through and renegotiate, and if you want to, we want 30% of the business now for the next tranche of money. And we're like, yeah, we're so close. <laughs> it just felt like such, I don't know, I just, it was a long time ago now, and I'm still kind of bitter by it. But <laughs> it, it, we were so close, and I was like, really? So we went through and I sat down with all 10 of the employees and we looked each other in the eye and said, okay, we can take this money, but we're selling off our first barn. You know, we're gonna, it's like Rumpelstiltskin, they want a heavy cost. And they're gonna own, end up owning a large portion of this company and who knows what's gonna happen after that. Or we can go through and go without pay. And we were looking at six to nine months without pay and we just didn't have the money. And every single employee individually said, I wanna go without pay because we ended up being an employee-owned business where the employees owned the business. Big difference, right? Big, big difference. And that was an extreme proud moment for me because I couldn't force everybody to do that. That was a thing we had to jointly go through and do. And we went through and six months later, we had great clips, they gave us a million bucks and we went through and bought out the investors. <laughs> and said, screw you guys, we don't want you. Anyway, Anyways, it was great. <laughs> Get rid of them. So here, here's the big problem, and hopefully this clip here works. Um, when you're raising money or going through and doing that, everybody thinks that that one allotment's gonna get it there. Oh, all we need is a million dollars or whatever it is, $5 million. And you see some of the companies up and down the Wasatch Front have raised tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. And it becomes a little bit of addiction because it's so easy to get this money. And that's the problem is remembering when to say no on this. The reality is you're gonna take three attempts to be able to get it right on your idea. So you can do that risking your own time and energy, or you can take someone else's money and risk it on their money. And when you do that, they end up owning you. So much like this guy here, we all believe as entrepreneurs we're gonna make that jump the first time. And we hope we will, right? But I, I will tell you, it's each time, and I, I, that's the good thing about entrepreneurs, we always believe we're gonna make it, even though it's the exact same setup. And we're like, it's, 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 I, it does, it takes three times. He makes it this time. <laughs> He doesn't make it, but <laughs> it just hurts every time. It hurts every time. Uh, but that's the thing is that if you take money on that first time, you're going to be back for two more rounds for sure. And that means by the time you're done, you're now working for somebody else. They own your business, you're working for them, and yet you're doing all of the hard work, all the sacrifice and everything else. It's really hard to find balance in life. It's really, find, it's really hard to find anything else in life. I spent a lot of days, I was really lucky as it was an executive team where we'd kneel in prayer. And we, all, we were all, you happened to be LDS, and we spent a lot of time making a lot of changes and a lot of sacrifices and a lot of self-reflection. And it's important to be able to say, you know, to do it the right way. And that's not to say raise, taking money from somebody else isn't a good thing. It's just be smart about it, be careful. Because when you walk into these guys, the first time you ask for money, man, they treat you like gold. They're like... And you like feel so cool. <laughs> You're like, dude, I feel so good. And then when you miss your marks and your targets and you will because it takes three times, it just does. You show back up for money the next time and they say. And you're like screwed. <laughs> they own you. <laughs> it's like, how did that happen? And it is, oh, I tell you. So you can't be cautious enough. All right. So here's the thing. With you. Let me get this. Okay. If you go through and look at this, in our situation, this happened to us. We only took $240,000. They owned less than, it was 6.5% of our business. And yet, who had the control? They did. They had the cash, and if they didn't give us the cash, we couldn't pay payroll. 
So guess what they made me do to get that first tranche of money, the first 240000 They made me hire someone that they said I had to hire, kind of like these guys here. Numbers are up. So VCs will make you hire a Terry Tate to be an office linebacker and run around your business. And they're not always helpful. I mean, it's kind of comical, but it, it's true. And, and you're kind of looking at this go, really? You're making me hire this person? They don't fit in? In this case, we at the time, all the employees were literally taken to $1,000 salary. We all had the same salary. It was really weird. We're all like gathered around with the <laughs> same salary. We're all making $1,000 a month. And that was to stretch our money out, right? Then we have to hire this guy at $10,000 a month. And we're like, we don't have the money for this. Why are we doing this? It was one of those crazy things. It didn't fit our culture, it didn't fit who we were, and it was all out of balance, caused problems. So that's the problem with the control side of it. Come here. Okay. So what I'd like to share with you now is a few, I know, I, I, sometimes I look out in the world and it was just frustrating for me g coming right out of school and trying to understand what was happening. And there's certain things in the business world that just didn't make sense to me. And I came up with this, this kind of moniker here, Kings, Lords, and Serfs, to help me explain what was going on in the business world so I could kind of deal with it. And the first one here is when you think of Kings, actually, let me play this video. <laughs> I love that guy. Um, we, all, we all want to claw our way up to middle management, right? Um, <laughs> and so I came with this, this kind of structure to help me understand the world out there. And kings, these are that first group of people. I bet some of you know a king. These are, the reason I use the word kings or queens, if you will, these are people who, through little effort of their own, they either fall into it or born into success. I like to say the rules of the world don't apply to them because they're kings. That's okay. Just let them be who they are. They're, they're always out there. I have a friend like this. I go, really? You just like fall into money. Good for them. <laughs> the, world, the rules don't apply to them. The next group of people is serfs. And this is just us, right? They're just working for the man. And the important thing here is don't know the value that you're creating. Therefore, you don't get the value that you deserve. Okay. If there's anything you should get ready to come out of school right now, know your value. You won't be able to command any kind of price if you don't know your value. Don't expect someone else to do it for you. Know your value, okay? The last one here is lords. Uh, these are people who take a personal risk. So in this case, they sacrifice pay today, like taking no pay, right? For ownership tomorrow. Uh, you're entrepreneurs. That's what an entrepreneur is. Take the risks. If you believe in an idea enough, you do it. You can be an employee entrepreneur right now. This is the idea of stock for pay, right? Go through and do that. So, the way I like to think of this is change your stars. Night's Tale, you guys ever seen this one? It's kind of fun. All right, so be inspired.
So how do you change your stars, right? That's really gets down to this. How do you go from being just an employee at a company to one who owns part of it? And that's where I like to kind of talk a little bit on some of these things. The idea of being an employee entrepreneur, think of yourself, you're gonna, most of you in here will take a job right when you get out of school. And that's a good thing, you learn a lot of things. As you're doing that, think of it as evaluating a startup, as a business plan. Go through and understand it. I cannot tell you how many times, I just had a friend of mine who is not young anymore. He's like 40 something, okay? And he took a job at a business, and I asked him, I said, well, what's the opportunity like? He goes, what do you mean? He goes, they offered me this much money. I said, well, that's nice, but what's the opportunity like? He goes, what are you talking about? And I said, the business, it's not making any money. You took a job at a business that's not making money. Are they ever going to make money? And, and it was kind of a, a little shock to him. I'm like, you're 40 years old and you're <laughs> <laughs> have an evaluated whether. So yes, as an employee, evaluate the business. Understand the opportunity. Understand their value prop. <coughs> know what it is they're doing. Because if you understand it, you can have an impact there. So first thing, look at fit. This is you evaluating yourself, saying, is this what I'm good at? Right? You need to know what you're good at. Next thing, where is your value? What are your core skills? Each of you know your core skills. These are things. Whether you like them or not, there are core skills. I'm good at math. I'm good at science. I'm good at ultimate frisbee. Yeah, I am. I like ultimate frisbee. Okay. And then ask the question, can I be a key employee? Has anyone ever heard of key man insurance? You ever heard of that before? So it's usually taken out on employees that in a small business where if that person were to die or become disabled, that the business would dramatically suffer. There are teams and sports that take out key man insurance on people's legs and on their arms, like for football players and other players, baseball players. Because if that person loses the ability to throw or to run, it becomes a big impact to the team. So the question I ask here is, can you be key? And I'll walk you through these. So first thing, evaluating fit. There are really three questions that I'd like to talk through here. The first is, what do I individually, ask yourself this question, like doing? What am I good at? And what are people willing to pay me for it? So. In my opinion, if you find two of these on your first job, you've done pretty good. Let's walk through it. So here's our little grid. So the first one, let's say it's something you like, but you're not really good at it, and people aren't going to pay you a lot of money. What's that? That is a hobby. <laughs> and you're a starving artist. OK. So good. it's great. You know, just, just understand what it is, right? OK. What about it's something that you're good at, but you don't like it, and you're not getting a lot of pay for it? What's that? No, sadly, that's where 99% of you are going to land. This is a job, and you're a surf. <laughs> that's most people. Sadly, that's most people. Most people get the pay that is the going wage, right? Most people don't get above average pay. Most people get the going wage. All right, next one. Let's say you're good at it, people are willing to pay you a lot of money. Yeah, this is a good job. That's why you're here in school, to try to get above average pay, above average value. Okay. The next one, let's say it's something you like and you're good at. But you don't get paid a lot. Yeah, this is a job that will make you content. And I have quite a few friends who have very good, balanced lives. And they're happy. Okay, nothing wrong with this at all. Again, you get two of them, you're doing really good. What if, this last one is kind of an interesting one, what if it's not something you like, you're not very good at it, and no one's willing to pay you a lot of money? This is a government job. <laughs> Although I guess I, this one doesn't work as well, because apparently in 2012 uh, we passed over some level in 
there are jobs that's kind of this category now, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But <laughs> that one does, I didn't know that one existed. Okay, the last one, obviously, if you can get all three, yeah, that's the cool part. As an entrepreneur, you get to choose these elements. And that would be the thing I'd say. So when you're evaluating fit, be, be honest with yourself as you're looking at any kind of job opportunity. Uh, I was just talking with my daughter at lunch today, just talking about this same kind of idea, evaluating fit for a job. Okay. So next one is where is your value? So you have your core skills and then there's unrelated skills. You know your core skills. If you went through and thought about it, in five minutes you could write down your top three or four skills and that's what are your base core skills. It's hard to change those. Those take years to kind of change in a dramatic way. And you know you're in, this, you're in a specific track right now because of your core skills. But when you think about in your job itself, if you're not using your core skills as the large portion of the job you take, what's happening, right? You're using all your unrelated skills you're not very good at. I can vacuum. I'm pretty good with a vacuum. I don't think I make a lot of money for the company if I'm vacuuming the hallways very much. You get the idea, right? So look at the kind of job, see what the requirements are, see what they're going to have you do. If you're doing a lot of time on these unrelated skills, okay, fine to cut your teeth a little bit, but evaluate it and say, you know what? I need to go through and make sure that the job has things that are close to the skills I'm already doing. Then I'm going to get some leverage out of what I'm doing. And that's the important thing, evaluate what it is you're doing. Another way to look at this is a job will t people will tell you what to work on, but they won't necessarily tell you how to increase your value. And, and that's where you need to sit down and say, well, what is it that the business is valuing? What is it that could help the business be more successful? Well, help the business come up with more ways to make money. And then your importance in that business will rise. Okay, so this next one I have is I, I call the four steps of keenness. I remembered I'd, I just finished my second year at my first company, Sterling Wentworth, right out of school. And um, the professor, actually, he's actually a professor here now, Gary Williams. And um, I sat down with him. He gave me a, a cola, cost of living adjustment. I was like, not impressed. <laughs> I was like, I just killed myself and worked my guts off this year. And, and he said, well, you know, we're, we're pleased to give you a 2.75% raise. And I'm like, really? <laughs> and I was like, kind of, I was very depressed at the time. And I said, I said, Gary, what do I need to do to get my value for this year? He goes, well, you need to become key. You need to become important. And I said, well, what is that? He goes, well, we know it when we see it. And I'm like, really? That's your answer to me? So I came up with these steps in con after that experience with Gary. And I've shared these back with him and said, well, what are the steps of key? So the first one is what I call step one, learn something of value that no one in your company knows. And now you're key by the act of scarcity. This also can be called the golem stage, you know, precious, you get your thing. And, and you've got it. Now, as great as it is to get to step one, a lot of employees never do. Especially if you're working in a big company with 3,000 employees, it's not going to happen. So small companies, you can go through and get to step one pretty quick. Learn something of value no one else knows. All right. Next one, move quickly on to step two. Don't get stuck in the precious stage. Teach someone else that one thing. You're now key because you're a trainer. And you're important to the business because you're duplicating knowledge. This is critical to any business that wants to grow, is duplicating its knowledge. <laughs> All right, step three, think outside the box. Create something of value to the company's top line. Now you're key because you're an innovator. You're helping the business find more sources of revenue, save costs, whatever it might be, doing something beyond your job description. There's not a job description out there that says, come up with new ways to make money. <laughs> There's all sorts of products and departments and everything else, but that's where you can distinguish yourself really quickly and go through and drive value. Last step, step four, Teach others to innovate. And now you're key because you are a leader in the business. Now, the thing that's interesting about this is you don't have to have that position of being an executive or a manager to become a leader in a business. I've seen it happen multiple times that people have no direct reports. They become leaders because of what they do. And that's an important aspect of things. Okay. Leadership and values. Uh, this is one way I always like to evaluate a company is to listen to the way the employees talk about it. If an employee talks about, this is my job, or they say, this is my company, it might seem like a small little nuance, but it's a big deal. If employees love the place they work, they'll talk about my company. If it's just a job, well, it's a job. 
you can get a job in a lot of places. And you know, go get, gain some experience. Uh, I'm always looking for something more, something more that embodies a great culture, a great experience, great people. And those attract more people. Uh, we have people that have been there <laughs> since our beginning. We have very low turnover, people that like to participate in the things we do and be a part of that. And, and that's been a lot of fun for us over time. Uh, the next concept I want to share with you is one I call swimming with gold. So you're a half mile from shore. You're on a boat with 90 pounds of gold. It's you and five of your friends. What are the chances that you can swim with 90 pounds of gold on your back a half mile to shore? It's probably not going to happen. <laughs> you might, but you might die. But what if each of you take 15 pounds? All right. Well, maybe. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. Tie it on your back and swim it in. Okay, maybe. And that's what happens in an entrepreneurship environment where the employees own the business because everybody's helping drive wealth. Everyone's helping manage costs. When it's someone else's money, you don't care about how expensive the chairs are. Our staff meeting every week, everybody would sit there and say, I lady at the front would get mad at me if I spent money on something because you said I didn't use a coupon. I thought it was great. <laughs> be careful with the money, right? Have it be shared. Well, the amazing thing is you end up going in, swimming that 90 pounds of gold there, and somehow when you add it all up, it's a loaves and fishes exercise. You end up with 300 pounds of gold because it grows and it multiplies because more people are involved in that process because they have a share in the game. So not to get in and name a company here, but um, there's a very big company around here with orange as their color and does security systems. Okay. Uh, they sold here know, a couple years ago, three years ago for $2.2 billion. That seems like a lot of money, right? 2.2 billion, feels like a lot to me. How many employees out of their, at the time they had 3,000 employees, how many employees do you think had stock ownership in that business? How many? 10? Really, you're not a dreamer, are you? <laughs> I would have hoped for 1,000, but that's me. They had, actually, you were extremely close, which is kind of scary, nine. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was amazed. I have two of the executives working for me. And I was kind of blown away. It's just, I was like, wow. And, and they didn't make very much. <laughs> so it's kind of crazy to think about. So the wealth was concentrated in very, just a few people, which is great for those people. But for all the employees, they didn't participate in it. And, and that to me is like, wow, you know, I mean, we've been lucky. We've had, you know, more than a dozen people. And we haven't even had an event yet pay off their homes. It's kind of how I measure the wealth of our company, is how many people have been able to pay off their homes. And right now, if our company got acquired or purchased or sold for what we're currently projecting, we'd probably have around 80 to 90 people pay off their homes, which, you know, it's a little less than a third of our employees, but pretty cool to think about. So anyways, those are the concepts I'd like to kind of share with you. All right, so what to expect. You're, you're going to go out, you're going to have your first job. Some of you there's, may even try starting something. Hope so. Right? Go out and try it. Go out and try to experience something firsthand. Here's what I'd leave with you. The, the parable of the great sea captain. Uh, has anyone heard this? I don't know if anyone has. Okay. So there was once a great sea captain whose fame was known throughout the seas as having pretty much won every single naval sea battle they'd ever been in. And what would happen is an enemy vessel would be spotted on the horizon and the first mate would turn to the great sea captain and say, fetch me my red shirt. And the first mate would run off and get the red shirt for the captain and they'd go into battle and they'd win. And so there's kind of this mystique about this red shirt kind of built up. And then one day, there was an armada of ships <laughs> spotted on the horizon. And the great sea captain turned to his first mate and said, fetch me my brown pants. <laughs> and so it is as being an entrepreneur. There's those days that not everything works out and they're scary as all get out. Uh, but never let them see you sweat, right? Uh, go through and believe, work through it. Um, I remember uh, when I was first starting in Moment, uh, I'd gone to a very close personal friend who I really high, highly ad admired his opinion on things and knew about our, uh, our space. And I said, what do you think about this idea? And he said, no one will ever switch from the old way of doing things. And in this case, it was mystery shopping. And have you ever mystery shopped and paid to go eat someone's food? Yeah. And, and that's what we were trying to compete with when we first started in a moment. And I was kind of like, are you kidding me? He goes, yeah, no one will ever switch. And I said, I don't care. Give me $20,000. I'm going to go start this thing. And he did. So, <laughs> but sometimes that's what it takes. Determination in the spite of things. If you believe in it, go risk it. Go take your time. Germinate that idea and build it up. Next concept, uh, violent execution. You know, 
one thing that every single one of you in here have that no one can take from you is your own determination. Uh, there's always going to be someone smarter. There's always going to be someone faster, whatever it is, able to leap tall buildings more than you. But if you're more determined than the next person, you can win. And that's the coolest thing. Uh, I had an employee named Dale Schroeder. And, you know, Dale, <laughs> he'd run through a wall for anybody. It was just awesome. And, and he wasn't the, the smartest, the brightest, or anything else. He was the first to tell you. But he would just wear you down. <laughs> he'd just wear you down. So on the idea of violent execution, we actually put this on our, our actual stock certificates in Latin, I think. It's in something, I don't know what that but uh, the idea uh, is, you know, from, from Patton here, more progress results from the violent execution of an imperfect plan than the perfection of a plan to violently execute. Too many times people talk and talk and talk and they don't do. The reality is your idea will be honed out in the refiner's fire of doing it. Get out and do it. Go get it done. Don't wait for it to be perfect. Go be determined and wear the other guys down. And then you'll succeed. Okay. So... If you think about this, and the world is written for you to come out and be employees and to take the going rate. And that's really good for businesses. The going rate's really good for businesses. So go ahead and do that. Or you can try to rewrite the rules a little bit and get better than the going rate. Or even better, become at least an employee owner or possibly an owner yourself and start up your own business and change the rules that are written. So maybe to wrap up, last little thought here. Thank you. Appreciate a chance to talk with you.